While some were sure that Napier was finished after the earthquake, that view didn't last long and there was soon a determination to rebuild the city and that started very quickly. The first two buildings to be reconstructed out of corrugated iron were a couple of the local public bars, the Masonic and the Provincial. And that was because in the laws of the day, if they hadn't opened within 24 hours of the disaster, they would lose their licenses. And there was no way in hell that was going to be allowed to happen. But apart from those two little shacks, no other building would be erected in the CBD until it could be properly rebuilt. By the end of February, the Municipal Reconstruction Department had been formed and it was decided to relocate the CBD to Clive and Memorial Squares. The shops were set up in Clive Square and the professional offices in Memorial Square. And over the road beside St Patrick's Church, the combined banks rebuilt their offices. And they didn't muck about either. The ballot was drawn on the 25th of February and 54 premises opened on the 15th of March. There had been some concern from the locals about the destruction of the trees in the squares, especially the palm trees. So it was decided to relocate these to McLean Park and re-establish them after Tin Town, as it became known, was dismantled when it had served its purpose. When this was finally done, only one tree had been lost. Tin Town was a great success, although to be fair, it didn't have any competition, but it was far from perfect. There was a problem with rats, as there were in quite a few parts of the town, and in the whole complex, there was just one toilet. On the 11th of March, two commissioners were appointed to oversee the reconstruction of Napier, John Thixton Barton and Lachlan Baines Campbell. These would prove to be a benevolent dictatorship, but nevertheless, they were instrumental in both an efficient and visionary reconstruction of Napier. And it would prove quite the job. All the land titles had been destroyed in the fires, all the survey pegs had been shifted God knows where, and that all had to be rectified. So the town was resurveyed, new land titles issued, but they did more than that. They widened streets, they put electricity and telephone wires underground, and they made sure all the shop verandas were suspended into a uniform regulation. Four architect firms were combined into the Napier Associated Architects. This was designed to combine resources and bring a, a unity of purpose to the rebuild. And the four of them, Finch and Westerholm, E.A. Williams, J.A. Louis Hay and Natouche and Sons, while working independently and following their own favourite styles, nevertheless gave to Napier a new and distinctive style. The first new building to go up was the Market Reserve Building, which began construction in August. It was owned by the Napier Borough Council and had been planned before the quake, but it was decided that this would be the first one to really signal to Napier that the rebuild was on. The quake had resulted in a new building code and regulations. All new buildings would be of reinforced concrete and René Latouche decided to redo the specifications for the Market Reserve building in order to lift the spirits of the people of Napier as well. Though a bit old fashioned, he decided to have riveted steel frame rather than welded. And as the rivets were being hammered in, people all over Napier could hear their city literally rising again. Things were changed for other reasons too, often quite kind ones. The English window frame manufacturers decided to give the building copper frames rather than steel for the same price, not just as a gift to the city of Napier, but also to set a standard for the new building. But it wasn't just the CBD. Schools needed to be rebuilt or strengthened. Roads and bridges needed replacement or at least repairs. The sewerage system needed total reconstruction on all the flat areas around Napier. And there was barely a single house anywhere between Wawa and Waipokara that didn't need at least one new chimney. It was noted that there was more building going on in Napier than the rest of New Zealand. It wasn't perfect though. The loan repayments for new businesses ruined some of the firms and were even hard on homeowners as well and the tram system was done for. Opened in 1913, it had never been profitable and the last tracks were removed in 1937. But overall it worked and it worked well. During the course of 1931 and 1932, nearly 150 premises 
in the new CBD were made ready for new occupants and Tin Town was dismantled in varying stages as the new owners claimed their new homes. They also made the most of things while they could. There was a very successful shopping week in the first week of September in 1931 and the pictures in the newspapers and magazines noted that it was a very, very happy occasion, or as they called it, a very gay affair. It would take most of the 1930s to fully re-establish Napier, but it could be argued the new Napier, as it was known, wasn't fully complete until over 30 years later, when it finally got its cathedral back. While a pro-cathedral had been built in 1932 and lasted until 1960, it wasn't the same and it was never big enough. So in 1955, they began the construction of the new cathedral and it would be 10 years later before it was completed. Precious Little had survived from the destruction of that first cathedral. A brass eagle lectern, a replica of the one in Westminster Abbey, though minus a couple of its lion feet, a brass altar cross and a few fragments of stained glass. But by a stroke of luck, a brand new window had arrived from England and was still in its packing case and survived unscathed. And when the new cathedral was consecrated on the 8th of October 1967, there it was installed. But all that was for the future. In late January 1933, Napier celebrated its rebirth as New Napier with a week-long carnival. The two commissioners would hand back control of the city to the Napier Borough Council, which would meet for the first time on the 15th of May in 1933. But for that week, Napier had a lot to celebrate, and boy, did they. Thank you for watching our story from the Library Vaults today. To learn more about Hawke's Bay history, come into Napier Libraries or visit our website at www.napierlibrary.co.nz. Stay tuned for our next dive into the Library Vaults.